Afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our talk today. My name is Heather Bacher, and I am the coordinator here in Indiana for the Women for the Land Initiative. We provide conservation education information for Hoosier ladies. Um, glad to have you here today. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and turn it over to our um, discussion leaders to begin. Uh, if you'd like to ask questions, you can certainly put those in the chat and we can have discussion after the presentation. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Liz to introduce herself and Don. Liz? Thanks, Heather. Um, my name is Liz Yetter. I'm the East Central Regional Specialist for SICM, which is State of Indiana Cooperative Invasive Management. Um, I'm joined here today with Don Slack, our project coordinator, and I believe Amber Slaughterbeck, um, our regional specialist in West Central Indiana, is also on the call. So thank you all for joining us. Um, so for those of you who have been with us for previous ones in this series, we're just continuing on focusing on plants that are woody today um, based on recommendations you gave us from last time. So we'll cover some you're probably familiar with and a few that might be new to you. So we will get going here now. Um, so first we're gonna, if you've joined us before, you know we always start with a couple definitions. So our native, what, what is a native species? So that's a plant or animal that's evolved in a place long enough to have complex relationships with the plants and animals and organisms around them. Um, so here we have some of our, we have our state tree, the tulip tree, we have pawpaw, which though it can be aggressive in the understory is still a native species. And we have the prairie purple cone flower. Um, and then on the flip side of that coin, to be an invasive species. These are species that are causing some sort of harm to human health, the environment, or the economy. And pictured here, we have our autumn olive, burning bush, and calorie pear, all three of which we'll talk about in more detail today. So we're going to get started here um, with multiflora rose. This one is um, one that was brought in um, and touted as a living fence. Um, for livestock, the livestock walk right through it. They don't see it as much of a boundary, um, but now we are finding it more and more um, in, especially in farm ground or ag ground that has been let um, go fallow. Um, it will create these dense thickets. It's hard to walk around in. Um, and it is on the noxious weed list here in the state of Indiana, which is, um, Another classification of plants that if your county has a weed board, the, this is one of the plants that they could send out a letter and say, hey, you need to control your multiflora rose. So gain into some idea of this plant. So it's typically multi-stemmed um, with stalks that we call canes and they can be a red, a green to like a rusty red color. The thorns, as you can see down here in this lower photo, um, are kind of curved and in pairs, so it will latch right onto you. Um, the leaves are seven to nine leaflets, so this whole thing here is the leaf, and there's white hair, very fine white hairs on the petiole where it attaches to the stem. So it multiple white hairs, multiflora rose, and it also produces a white bloom, small white blooms in the spring. Um, shown here. And again, this time of year, you're going to see those rose hips. Um, the rose hips on the multiflora rose are much smaller than some of our native roses, which we'll see here in a minute. Um, same with the blooms um, on our native roses. The blooms tend to be larger in a pinkish color, whereas the multiflora rose, they're small, dense clusters of these white flowers. Um, for treatment of multiflora rose, you have a few options. This is one that regular mowing of an area can um, greatly reduce and um, eventually exhaust that root system and clear this plant. So if you have a field that's starting to get taken over by small multiflora rose and you can get out there with a bush hog or similar equipment, regular mowing, keeping it mowed down and low, that will prevent it from spreading. It will keep the canes at bay and it will eventually with 
two to four years be completely knocked out. It is, um, it does take time to get out there um, and keep it mowed down, but it can be effective. Um, your other option for this um, is a foliar spray. So you're gonna go out um, and make sure 3% glyphosate should knock it out in water, May to September, as long as those leaves are out um, and knock it back that way. Um, you can do cut stump, but these, um, if any of you have ever tangled with multiflora rows, one, it's covered in thorns. So you have to have thick gloves and thick, thick jeans to get out there in that, to do that. And it's usually a very small multi-stemmed plant. And so it's just not as practical. And as always, you can do a combination of mechanical and chemical treatments. Um, so mowing it down to get it to a more manageable size is also always an option because um, they do get quite thick and they can get over your head. So this, um, and you will get these slides as well. This is just um, a table um, that kind of looks at our native roses, which you'll see photos of here in a second with, compared to our multiflora rose. Um, the big distinguishing factors that you're gonna see um, are the, if it's flowering, the small white flowers compared to these larger pink flowers, um, the greater number of leaflets, as well as um, those white hairs on the end of the stems. So here's one of our native rows, um, smooth wild rose. Um, again, so you can see just from the photo, the much larger pink, white to pink, um, flowers, you have thorns all along the stem in this one instead of in those pairs. And you have five leaflets here and it's lacking in those white hairs. We have our swamp rose, um, which again, we're lacking in those white hairs um, and the, that large pink flower. Our Meadow rose or climbing rose, you got the darker pink, typically three leaves on the petiole and um, the hips on all of these, I couldn't find good photos of the hips. They're gonna be um, noticeably larger than the multiflora rose that is kind of smaller in statue in terms of its flowering and fruiting bodies. And one more, um, our native pasture rose. And here you can see, here's one of the hips. Um, so yeah, those are our native roses. They're great, they're beautiful to see. Um, they do tend to bloom a little later than the multiflora. So um, moving on, another one we're all probably familiar with, you've got your bush honeysuckles. Um, there are five, four, I'm sorry four species um, that are included on the terrestrial plant rule here in Indiana. They, as you can see in the photo here, they, are, they inhibit growth underneath them, both by blocking out sunlight to the forest floor, but also some of them are releasing chemicals from their roots. So they are preventing um, regrowth of both um, overstory trees, but also they're preventing the growth of spring wildflowers. Um, the fruits, so see on this next slide here, um, right now this time of year, they're loaded in these red berries. These red berries are not um, nutritionally significant for our bird populations. Um, they're just pure sugar to them, so they don't give them lasting, long lasting energy that they need. Um, so while birds do eat them, they're not the proper nutrition for them. Um, if you're looking to identify this, um, it has those opposite leaves, so those leaves that are in pairs right across from each other, the bright red berries turning red this time of year, as well as the hollow pith. So this inner part of the stems, even when you cut it off at the base, you're going to see this um, kind of pinprick of a hole in the middle of there. Um, so this is one, it's found throughout the entire state of Indiana. and um, it's probably one we get the most calls on or people are most familiar with. Um, moving forward, these next few plants that we're going to talk about all have very similar or the same treatment methods, and we'll get to those at the end of this section of shrubs. 
Um, there are some native honeysuckles. Um, however, they are fairly rare in the state of Indiana. They're more of a northern species. Um, however, the northern bush honeysuckle is found in the horticulture trade, so it might be something you might be able to find. Um, some of the big differences between these are one, the stems, they're going to be hollow all the way through if you cut into them, and two, with the American fly honeysuckle, the flowers are going to be hanging down instead of upright, and they're more of a yellow color instead of that white and yellow upright tube we see on our the bush honeysuckles we encounter here. And then there's the northern bush honeysuckle, um, which again, solid pith, but instead of a tooth, instead of a smooth outside leaves, the leaves are toothed and they have a capsule-like fruit. So it's going to have um, kind of an outer shell instead of a squishy berry. And then one more that um, looks pretty similar um, and can throw you for a loop if you find it out is the native coral berry. Um, it's in the same family as honeysuckles, but it's not um, the same species. So it's got opposite leaves, just like our honeysuckle does, as you can see in this upper picture. So they're in those pairs. However, the leaves are um, round and um, are this kind of darker leathery green and the berries are in clusters all along the stem with small kind of less um, smaller flowers, excuse me, um, that are bell shaped. So again, just a comparison to them, to each other, um, and then Our next one um, to be on the lookout, especially this time of year, is Japanese barberry because it turns this lovely shade of red and is easy starts to get easier to pick out of side of the, out of the woods. Um, as you can see in this photo, it will grow kind of similar to multiflora rose, where it takes over and creates this dense thicket that's hard to walk through. Um, and we'll look at it up close. And there's also a lot of cultivars. You might have seen this yellow or this lime green color here, or this purple one in landscaping. Um, they're very popular. These ones are a little bushy, but they do, they cut down into nice squares, um, which is one of its, and they're very that thick. Um, so one of its characteristics that make it popular in landscaping. But looking at it up close, you'll see these bright red oval shaped berries and these teardrop or paddle shaped leaves that are kind of in a world bunches along the stem. Um, here they are when they're still kind of green. You have these thorns throughout the stem here um, that are slightly curved and very sharp. You have these kind of bell shaped flowers. And then the inside, when you cut into them, the wood is going to be this yellow. Um, bright yellow color. And this is one when those branches, as they get bushy and kind of wild, when they touch back down in soil, they can actually, um, I've seen them where they've rerooted there and like sent out a runner and come up again. So that's one of the ways is how they're spreading. And then birds, they can travel, those seeds can travel quite far away from maybe the mother plant that you would think. The other concern with Japanese barberry um, is those thick, dense patches like we showed in that first photo. Underneath there, it's a very protected area because of the thorns and it's keeping it warm and moist down there. So it's great habitat for mice, um, which are one of the main vectors for ticks. So there have been um, several studies done where, um, and it's been found that a forest with higher levels of Japanese barberry, there's a higher chance of Lyme disease carrying tick population in the area, um, which is makes it bad for recreation, for humans, for animals, um, and is not something we want to encourage. So definitely one be on the lookout for if you find it in 
a small population prioritize that, getting that out of there um, before it becomes a big problem. Again, another one to look for this time of year, that um, burning bush, also sometimes called winged burning bush or winged euonymus. Um, it's big distinguishing characteristic aside from when it turns bright red and pink in the fall are these quirky wings along the stems that come out at angles. Um, you can see them here and you can kind of see them in the upper photo as well. Those are its um, most defining characteristic, especially when compared to um, the also invasive spindle tree, which we'll talk about, and then our two native varieties of euonymus shrubs. Um, so again, this one, it might not, um, if you have it in your yard or in your landscaping, you probably won't find a bunch of little babies surrounding it there, but it does get spread primarily by seed into surrounding wooded areas and other areas. So it is moving and we do find them in the woods. Um, one that might be a little less familiar is um, spindle tree. So it's also a euonymus. This is one we don't have a good idea of the extent of the population in Indiana. We do know it is in the state. Um, and it, as you can see on the branches here, does not have those quirky wings. Um, however, it does have a similar shaped fruit, but this one is pink with an orange, pink capsule with an orange aerial inside. Um, you have, it does have some fall color. This one grows more upright and in, in a tree shape than in a multi-stem shrub um, than the burning bush does or the next two we're gonna talk about, which are, um, and this is a, chart to compare um, and you'll see photos we're going to talk about our native strawberry bush and our native euonymus next um, so this is strawberry bush it is a native shrub here in indiana um, the big distinguishing characteristic on this one is the fruit you still have that pink capsule with the orange inside but the pink capsule is bumpy um, it has these little spikes on it um, and a slightly different shape in the leaf, still opposite, still green new growth, but a little longer leaves um, with a long petiole. And the flower, five parts on the flower, but they're pretty small. They can be hard. They're easy to miss when you're out looking at it and if it's not the right time of year. And then there's Eastern Wahoo or just Wahoo, um, which grows more similarly to the burning bush. You again, you've got a pink, fruit capsule with a red inside this time um, and dark purple flowers um, that are that kind of hang off on longer stems. So this is one, it's a native shrub to Indiana. You can find it growing wild in the woods. Um, so it's a good, if you want, um, if you're looking for a similar shrub to the burning bush, if you can find it, it is a great option. Um, we do have a few more, and this is just a very small list of um, native alternatives to for a great fall color. Um, our native sumacs, they turn lovely shades of red in the fall. Um, black chokeberry also turns a great shade of red. We've got the winterberry holly and American witch hazel bringing in those yellows, American viburnum. Uh, or arrowwood by Burnham, excuse me. And this is just a very small list of options that are still gonna get you some great fall color. Um, autumn olive. So this is one, um, it's an alternately arranged shrub. So the leaves and the branching are gonna be um, not in pairs on the stem, but across from each other. So you can see here, this one is distinguished, um, these silver-backed leaves. Um, you can see them driving down the road when they're fluttering in the wind, they look, they sparkle in the sun. Um, this one has thorns. Um, it has these short 
stout thorns that if they get into you are um, very painful and the human body does not like having them in them in us. Um, not that we like any thorns, but these ones can cause, um, the sites typically do get, can get infected. Um, and then the new growth you can kind of see in these photos has this coppery kind of coloring to it. Um, it's speckled kind of coppery colored. And so these ones, in addition to, these were ones that were planted um, or touted as good for wildlife. They do produce a berry, which I believe we'll see on the next slide. Um, and wildlife will eat them in a pinch, but it is not their preferred, it's not their preferred food. It doesn't provide them as good as nutrition as our native plants. And these plants are also nitrogen fixers. So as these are rooting and in the soil, they are going to um, actually be changing the soil and fixing more nitrogen to it. So here we can see the berries. Um, they're these red speckled berries. Um, they're kind of astringent tasting. Humans do eat them. Some people make fruit leather out of them. Um, but they each these um, shrubs can produce massive amounts of fruit, even though they're small. So 80 pounds of fruit in a growing season. And that's a lot of berries when you're looking at them there because they're not very big. Um, so this is definitely one um, to remove if you do have it. It is one found more on in open areas and edges. Um, you will find smaller ones in the interior of woods, but it's really going to get established and be dominant in those open areas. So this one, um, the next few, we're going to go over a couple buckthorns. And this is one that you might not be as familiar with. Um, we do have it in the state, throughout the state, but it's a little more scattered. So it's um, leaf and branching arrangement is opposite to sub opposite. So if we look at the leaves here, you can see they're almost right across from each other, but not perfectly symmetrical like our honeysuckles were, but they're still considered oppositely arranged. Um, they have these rounded leaves that come, tooth leaves that come to a point. Um, and then they have these leaves will persist pretty much until the first frost at green. They don't really change color. And then you have these green to dark black, turning dark black when they're ripe berries. And you can just see here the amount of fruit um, one of these can produce. And this is just like the side of the tree. Um, these are an understory shrub, technically. Um, they can get quite large and are typically multi-stemmed or multi-stems that fuse together. Um, as you can see here, they're kind of gnarly. This one is a larger, older buckthorn. Um, so you can see starts as one and then kind of branches off. Um, again, here's the fruit, that kind of, that round leaf with the veins coming out. And then in the winter, if you're looking at these plants, the big um, buckthorn, so the terminal buds here, you can see they're always in pairs and they have this thorn in the middle of them. So when they're very close together like this, they do look kind of like a hoof, I think. Um, so buckthorn, deer hoof, um, kind of keep that in the back of your head. So that paired, terminal bud with a thorn in the middle. There are thorns along, small thorns along the branching as well, but these thorns, they, um, while they are sharp, they are very weak. They do not, they will break off um, if you grab onto them. Um, here it's pictured next to black cherry. Um, sometimes when they're young, the bark, as you can see, and this photo a bit is quite dark, similar to black cherry bark. Um, so there can be some confusion there, um, especially if you're looking at it without the leaves on it. But black cherries, they are alternate. So they are not gonna have their buds in pairs, except maybe on the end here, but they're also going to be lacking that thorn. Another um, glossy buckthorn, 
This one is um, truly alternately arranged. So the leaves are gonna be um, kind of zigzagged on along the stem, along with the fruit, as you can see, is all along the stem. This one does not have thorns. Um, and you can see it's got the smooth edge leaves and these very distinct veins in the leaf um, kind of all throughout it. And then the fruit on this one is gonna start off, um, it's gonna go green to red to dark black. And instead of um, in clumps, it's more spread out along the branching. Um, and the roots of these ones are bright red. And we'll see that here in the next slide. So these are the roots of glossy buckthorn. Um, so if you're out there pulling them out when they're young, these bright red roots. And then the young growth is gonna be this coppery color with these, um, large white lenticels on them. So I mentioned before that um, common buckthorn along with glossy buckthorn, but common is more dark orange. It has this orange tint under it. So if you were to scrape these, the buckthorn are gonna have this orangish to them. If you cut them down, they have these really dark orange centers, whereas black cherry does not. And then if we look over here at the young growth or getting older, black cherry does have lenticels like glossy buckthorn, but it has more of this red, reddish coppery color to it. Common buckthorn is not going to have um, the lenticels. And then as glossy buckthorn matures, it loses that red coppery color and it turns into this gray with the lenticels. Um, if you're looking at a mature tree with, I should have included it and I did not, um, a mature cherry tree leaf is going to be long and skinny, um, as opposed to the round leaves we find on either of the buckthorns. Um, Dawn, you want to talk about meadowsweet or Japanese spirea? Sure. So Japanese spirea is another shrub that we are finding more and more in the woods of Indiana. It's a very popular landscape plant. I was just on a landowner survey yesterday with an, I don't know, they had probably eight bushes and their woods next to them were impacted already with um, Japanese spirea growing throughout. This is four to six feet tall um, and it can get very leggy looking when it's outside of your landscape where most people kind of keep it in a, a more of a shrub like roundish ball when they trim it. But when it's growing in the woods by itself, it can get up to six feet tall and appear leggy. It does have alternate leaves that are very coarsely toothed, as you can see in that middle picture there. And they are dark green on the top and very lightly hairy on the bottom. So they have just a little bit of a soft feel to the bottom of the leaf when you touch it. The flowers are, for the most part, pink. Sometimes they can have a little bit of, of a whitish hue to them. And then as they grow in the shade, they become a little more purple. Um, but again, typically what you see is that that photo in the middle is a, that's almost, in fact, that was taken in my woods, um, where when we moved in, they had about three of these bushes planted in the landscape. And that was eight years ago. Today, I'm still finding you know, six foot tall shrubs that, that pop up. And that is typically what I see right there in the middle when I find them. <laughs> so Japanese spirea here again, just a few more pictures for you to look at. It's got a coppery colored stem against that dark greenish leaf. That is perfect. That is exactly what you're going to see in the woods kind of leggy looking, and then those are what the um, flowers look like after they have um, produced fruit, just tiny little clusters of fruit um, that are kind of hard when you feel them. <laughs> um, and then there are a couple native spireas I included um, as well. So the first one, um, steeple bush, which has a very different, it's um, very different shaped flower. It grows up in that um, kind of cone shape as opposed to the flat ones we are seeing. And then the backside of the leaves are white, um, white to silvery underneath. And this grows more in patches instead of little balls or clumps. Um, and it tends to be shorter. And this one likes white areas. 
And then there's um, White Meadow Sweet, which is, um, if you didn't guess by the name, has a white flower growing in, again, that kind of column there. Um, five petals and still, again, a toothed, dark green toothed leaf. Um, so yeah, so once to, so there are native options in the spirea if you like that type of plant. Um, okay, so Asian bittersweet. Um, it's been dubbed the kudzu of the north because it can cover ground just like um, kudzu does in the south. It has alternate simple leaves. Um, as you can see here throughout the stem that come to a sharp point. It produces, the Asian bittersweet produces um, fruit that are all along the stems of the vines, as you can see here. And how these guys kill the trees is they are, you can see it wrapping around itself in this photo, but they will actually wrap around and cut into the trees and they cut off that flow of nutrients to the top of the tree. Um, and they're killing the trees that way. It will also grow along the ground as well as a vine. So it climbs, it'll cover the floor. This is one, um, there is an American version of bittersweet um, and it does look pretty different. The fruit, instead of, so on this page, we have a yellow shell with um, an orange inside. On these, it's going to be dark orange on the outside and red in the middle. Um, and the fruit on the American bittersweet is terminal. So it's going to only be at the end of the vine and far less fruit is produced, as you can see down here. Um, the, the American bittersweet does twine around trees like the Asian bittersweet does. However, it is not um, twining as tight or as thick um, as the Asian bittersweet um, and does not grow in as dense of populations. These two can hybridize. Um, and if you suspect the only way to tell if it's a hybrid is to have it tested genetically. Um, but again, we have that chart comparing the two. Um, if you're, um, and there's also, so the best way to tell is by the fruit, both where they are placed, fruit or flower, both where they are placed along the vine. Um, however, um, only female vines produce fruit. So if you don't have that, if you look at the leaves, um, the Asian bittersweet um, are less long than they are wide, whereas the American is the opposite of that. Um, but generally, if you have a very dense, thick patch of it, you're looking at the Asian bittersweet because of it. That's the nature of how it grows. Um, and it is, it can take over an area. Excellent question. I do not know where we would send it to be tested, Amber, but that's a good question. Dawn? Okay. So um, generally though, hybrids, if it doesn't look right, if you can't tell based on where the fruit is placing, um, at least I tend to recommend erring on the side of caution and removing it. Um, this is also one that's very popular in the landscape, or not landscape, but in the um, like crafting world, it gets made into wreaths and occasionally it can be mislabeled um, when you're going out to buy it because of how hard it is to tell them apart without fruit or flower. Um, so be careful if you're purchasing these things, but also be careful if you're crafting with them or pick up a wreath at a craft festival made out of bittersweet with the berries that you're not disposing of it by throwing it in the woods because those berries are still viable. Um, oof. Your name. Um, so that should say vine, not wine. Um, <laughs> 
we will get that corrected before I send these slides out to you. So most of these plants can be treated in a similar fashion um, with um, a couple exceptions. So spirea, um, because it is, it doesn't get as thick or as wide as some of our other shrubs and vines we've talked about, mowing can work with it to help keep it contained. Um, it will not completely exhaust it, but will, it can greatly reduce that seed production and adding to the seed bank. And spirea is one um, mostly due to its growth habit, lots of small stems, doing a foliar spray is the recommendation there. For your larger honeysuckles, autumn olives, burning bush, um, and vine, um, bush honey, or excuse me, bittersweet vines, um, a cut stump can be done um, as well for, for bittersweet vines that are growing along the ground. You can do a foliar on those. Um, basil barking can be used um, on these multi-stem shrubs or on the, um, would be effective on the buckthorns that grow more in a tree shape. Um, you just, when you're doing that on multi-stem shrubs, you must get every stem. I have had some landowners who've been using basil barking more in fence rows where they don't want to risk old fence rows, where they don't want to risk cutting into um, barbed wire and stuff like that. And they, the fence has to come down anyway. So if these die and bring it down, then um, they'll deal with it then. So that has been, um, I've had a few people been using it that way. So they don't have to try to cut these out of the fence rows. Um, couple trees and then we'll get to some questions. So tree of heaven, that's not a tree on your screen, but that is the spotted lanternfly, um, which is, uses tree of heaven as one of its host plants. We do have spotted lanternfly here in the state of Indiana. It's been found in two spots, um, one down in Switzerland County and one up in Huntington, Indiana. So very far apart. Um, so definitely something to be on the lookout for. But tree of heaven, it will, it's one of these plants that creates colonies. It spreads both via seed and via root sprouts. Um, it's also released those chemicals to inhabit growth around it and it will grow anywhere um, other than in the shade deep shade um, but it would grow it'll grow up through the cracks of the concrete it will grow um, in the poorest soils imaginable it's just um, so here's what it looks like um, it also is sometimes called stink tree because if you've ever smelt one it smells kind of like rotting peanut butter um, it has large leaflet or large leaves made up of um, lots of leaflets, as you can see here. They are alternate and they have these notches at the end of the leaf. The seed, which is turning red right now, um, has is kind of a flat oval shape with the seed in the middle. And it has these upright columns of flowers when it is flowering. If you were to break off one of these leaves, this is what the leaf scar looks like, kind of this U shape. And then the inside you have this um, kind of dark light brown pith. Um, so for tree of heaven, a little bit different in terms of treatment options. Um, so you can do a foliar treatment for the small trees where you can get the leaves for those wreath sprouts. And then we recommend a basil barking for larger ones um, due to the fact that if you cut into these trees, it sends a, a signal to the roots that they have been damaged and they must re-sprout in order to continue living. Um, so sometimes that's unavoidable if it's a very large tree of heaven. Um, so, but if you can not avoid it, do. If not, just know that if you take down tree of heaven, you're going to have to come back in and do um, consistent follow up to pull your spray those re sprouts. Um, this is one also keep in mind, I don't think I've mentioned it. If you're anything you basil bark, that is going to result in a standing dead tree or shrub. So if you're doing it, make sure one, you're aware that that will eventually come down. So hope so um, be aware of your surroundings when you're doing it. So it's not going to come down in on 
things that are important, like structures, other trees, um, safety hazards, stuff like that. And I believe, so then we've got our calorie pair. Um, so you can find it. It was a very popular street tree. It still is a very popular street tree. Um, there are some varieties that cannot produce fruit amongst themselves. Um, they cannot cross pollinate if they're with the planted with the same variety, but they will cross pollinate if there are other calorie pairs of different varieties nearby, which in a lot of cases there are. So while that tree itself may, may very well be considered sterile, it is going to find a way if there are the, the same species nearby. Um, so this Martin County, um, 80 acres of this preserve, or 80%, excuse me, um, have been inundated with calorie pear. You can see it in the white and in the green. It is one that is um, leaving our nicely lined streets and um, taking over the understories of our native or natural areas. Calorie pear um, does not respond negatively to fire. If you run fire through an area, it will respond with um, a vengeance. So it's one that where you're either pulling, spraying, or cutting um, to get those out. So just a little more ID. Um, so you have the white flowers, they come out first before the leaves emerge, and then you'll have your leaves and these little brown fruits that will come out. They can get quite large. Um, trees that have been produced as a result of um, pollination and fruit from the street trees um, may have thorns when you find them in the woods. Again, just a few more photos. Um, one of the reasons it's such a popular street tree is that triangle shape. It's a nice pyramid shape, um, which people find very attractive. Um, and then I believe our last tree we'll talk about, and then we'll open this up for the discussion, is white mulberry. Um, so white mulberry, alternate leaves, alternate tooth leaves that can vary. They can be lobed, um, like you see in this pictures. They can be not lobed, like you can see over here. They don't have um, a uniform leaf throughout the tree. Um, uh, the leaves are going to have more of a shiny upper surface and a smooth underside. And if you break off the petiole, milky sap, at the tip, that's not always, that's not an all year round kind of thing. Um, and then you have the flowers here, they're hanging down in catkins, and then you have um, blackberry-like fruit in its shape that turns white, that starts out white, turning the dark purple um, throughout the year. And as you can see in this back photo, they get quite large. There is a native red mulberry, um, which I don't know if I included photos now that I'm thinking of it, um, but that is fairly rare here in Indiana. White and red will hybridize and the white can transmit disease via the roots to the native red. This was one, it was brought in um, and widely planted during early settlement um, in the idea that um, it's a host for silkworms. And so they were gonna create a North American silk trade that did not ever come to fruition. Um, and so now we have all of these mulberry trees, white mulberry trees. So the differences between um, white and red and also paper, but, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so the red mulberry, the fruits are starting out red turning purple, whereas white, white are turning to that pink dark red. Um, the, let's get, I don't think they include, I did not include photos. I will get that added before I send this to you or I'll send a, um, 
I'll send you a separate guide for that when these come out to everyone who's joined. Sorry about that. Um, the red mulberry are usually the leaves tend to be bigger in statue, have a rough upper surface and a hairy underneath. Um, and then that yellow, yellowish inner bark on the white mulberry um, is a good indicator between the two. For control of your calorie pair and your mulberry, you have a few options. Um, so again, hack and fray or basil bark, those are both gonna create standing dead, um, but is an option if it's a larger tree that is in an area where it would be difficult or um, this can be more cost effective in order to get it down. Um, and then also similar to our shrubs that cut surface treatment is also always an option for these or for smaller ones. And like with any of these, if you can yank them out by the roots, you can kill them that way. Um, but the larger you get, the larger roots, you're gonna have more soil disturbance. So there's always trade-offs to consider when looking at managing your woody plants. And that is all I have. So I'm